Hello again, and uh, we're still working through Hebrews. We're going to be some time in Hebrews because it's it's uh, an interesting book. It has a number of chapters in, and the teaching is not exactly easy. And the subject I'm going to deal with today is probably one that most preachers avoid. <laughs> But um, I have to deal with it. <coughs> so I'm starting in Hebrews chapter 6. I don't think I shall get any further than chapter 6 today. Um, but as I begin, I have to begin by referring back to the end of chapter 5. Because when I finished, I did sort of cross the barrier into chapter 6. And what Paul is dealing with is something very complicated, very difficult, and I think you'll understand why a lot of preachers avoid this. You see, at the end of chapter 5, Paul is warning people against falling away from the truth. And I used an illustration, I don't forget the illustration I used last time, which was of the boy, young boy who put to bed at night, kept fawning out. And uh, eventually his mother said to him, why do you keep falling out of bed? And his answer was, very profound. It was, well, mum, it's because I stay too near to the getting inside. That's where we start. You see, we have to be so careful about the truth. And Paul, going on, is saying at the beginning of chapter 6, let us leave the elementary teachings and in the previous chapter, he is saying you need milk. No, you need solid food. Anyone who lives on their milk, still being an infant, is not acquainted with the full teachings of Scripture. So he's saying, let's move on. Let's, let's be mature in our understanding of Scripture, of course, I, I must admit that there are a lot of people who are Christians, but they tend to be on the fringe. But what we're talking about here is people who really want to know the Lord. So he says, we're going to leave the elementary teachings um, and go on to maturity, not to start and lay again the foundation of repentance. You see, and here Paul does describe repentance, he says, because it's repentance from acts that lead to death. Mm. After all, we know that without Christ there is no glorious eternity for us. But he says that we've got to move away from the primary early teaching about repentance, about faith, about instructions about baptisms, and oh boy, oh boy, does this uh, create a problem, because sadly, and I'm going to have to say this, um, because it comes very clearly in Romans, that you cannot baptize a child because Baptism, according to Paul's teaching in Romans, is a baptism of repentance. And how can a child who theoretically is without sin, and again, this is a difficult subject, but discussing this many, many years ago in my teenage years with my father, and I discuss all these issues with my father. In fact, I learned more from him than I did through any Bible college. They didn't deal with the difficult subjects. With my dad, I could deal with the difficult subjects because 
most of us would assume that until a child reaches an age of maturity, that um, children can, it's believed, go to heaven because it's believed that the age of maturity is 13 in under Jewish law. And so that's why the contrast here is between those who are living as children on the milk of the word and those who are being adult. And I think we've got to see the difference here in a moment that it will come out. So baptism is very clear in Scripture. It is, Jesus says, the teaching of the New Testament is repent and be baptized for the remission of sin. And just without going into the detail, baptism is a symbol of death, that when you are put down into the water and immersed in the water, Paul says that's a symbol of dying with Christ. And when you come out of the water, it is resurrection. Right, so let's move on from baptisms. We come to the laying on of hands. We're going to move on from this because this is a, a, an entirely separate teaching. I will deal with this later. But we should move, move on from baptism, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So the resurrection of the dead is a fact. Come on. That's what the Bible teaches, resurrection. That's the glory of, of the gospel. It is a, a, a gospel of resurrection from the dead, that we will rise again. And, of course, the converse of that, which is eternal judgment, that the Bible is absolutely clear that all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive reward for our faithfulness, and of course, if we have not accepted Christ at the judgment seat, we are condemned. Now, moving on from that, and it's important to look at this because in verse 4, Paul then says that once we've moved on from that basic level, it's impossible for those who've been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in and received the Holy Spirit, those who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God, and experience the powers of the coming kingdom if they fall away to be brought back to repentance. Oh, because why? Because to their shame, they're crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Now, the whole question here, and I, I, I can assure you that I battled this out so many times with my father, it's the whole question of some people teach and say that once you're saved, you're always saved, you cannot lose it. Now, <laughs> the number of evenings that I argued with my father of this uh, meant that it really became very firmly fixed in my spirit because he, and of course he came out of the Welsh Revival and the early teaching, the very wonderful teaching of those days, what he said was this, it's very clear that although Scripture says clearly, none shall pluck them out of my hand, which is a clear statement, no person, no demonic power, not even Satan himself, can take you out of the kingdom of God. But if you willfully deny the blood of Christ, 
if you turn your back on God, then, unfortunately, it's impossible for those who have entered into the experience and been enlightened, if you do that, to renew your salvation. In fact, discussing it with my father, he agreed with me that it is an extreme measure. And in his own case, unfortunately, he said one of his own brothers, and they must have grown up, I don't know so much about the background, but they must have grown up in a very close relationship with God. But he said one of his own brothers turned away, denied the truth, and is guilty of trampling underfoot the blood of Christ. But it's not easy. It's a very rare experience, fortunately. But it really comes down to the position that this is not just simply a, a, a backsliding or, a, as unfortunately some do, which is to, just for a brief period, go back into sin, there is a repentance for that sin. Because that's why the scripture is absolutely clear, and Paul is so clear when he says that Christ lives to make intercession for us. And in the previous chapters, I've shown you that Paul says that Christ was subject to the same weaknesses and temptations that we are. And look, I'm not perfect. And since I came to Christ, yes, I've made many mistakes. I've done things that I should not have done. And there are three kinds of sin. There's sin of commission. That's things that you do deliberately. But there's also sins of omission where you fail to do what you should do. But there is repentance and there is forgiveness because that's why it's the humanity of Jesus who's in the kingdom, the very humanity of Jesus who is pleading before his Father for us, Lord, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. But the difference here. If you're looking at verse 4, it's impossible for those who have matured and understand, who've received the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's impossible if you, from that stage, absolutely deny Christ. You trample underfoot the blood of Christ and you put him to an open shame. But this is not easy to get that far down. I don't want to frighten you. I just want to warn you that Paul has to deal with this issue because there are some who name the name of Christ and then turn away and deny him and deny salvation. Unfortunately, if you go that far back, it is impossible to come into the kingdom. Paul puts it in a slightly different way in verse 7, where he says, Land that drinks in rain falling on it and produces a crop useful for those for whom it's farmed and who receive the blessing of it, spiritually, if you have that experience, then, despite the fact that there can be problems in the crop, uh, the wheat and the tares, if it, you look at verse 8, land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and in danger of being cursed, and in the end it will be burned. What is Paul saying here? What he's doing is simply a comparison between farmed land 
that's farmed effectively and produces a crop, and land that receives just the same rain from heaven and just the same sun that the good, healthy land receives. But if that land produces no fruit and no effect, then it's cursed and burnt. So this literally is a description of our Christian lives, and I'm going to come on to that even more deeply in a few moments. You see, it's very, very clear that having found Christ, we have to live at that Christian life. It, it's, it's an active life to produce fruit. And if I give you a very simple illustration, it's in Mark 11, you know, the scripture, when the disciples were hungry coming out of Jerusalem, they were on the Mount of Olives and they were looking for some food and Jesus saw the fig tree. And there was no fruit, only leaves. Yeah, it wasn't dead. It was alive. There were leaves, but there was no fruit. And Jesus cursed it, and it died. Now, that is a very clear indication of what Paul is saying here, that if we live and in our so-called Christian lives there's no evidence, no fruit, then we come under the curse. There should be the evidence in our lives. It's going on. It's, it comes out again. And th this, is, this is so important because even Peter queried why Jesus cursed that tree. But he cursed it because it had leaves and no fruit. And there is a danger with some people, even in the church, who produce a lot of oh, leaves, a lot of shout, a lot of emotion, a lot of talk, but yet don't produce any consistent fruit from their lives. They fall under the same problem. So, moving on from this in verse 9, even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case. So I'm glad to be able to say that I'm virtually certain that every one of you listening to me, the very fact you're listening is you're learning and you don't fall into that category. So verse 9, although we have to speak this and say this, we're confident that with you, you have the things that accompany salvation. And God is not unjust in verse 10. He will not forget your work and the love that you have shown him as you've helped. Look at this. To me, this really epitomizes so many of you who are listening to me. God is not unjust. Verse 10. He won't forget your work, the love that you've shown him as you've helped his people and continue to help them. And we want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end. So don't stop. Don't give up. You know, this is one reason why, why I have to continue despite my age. I have to continue. Even I must not give up and must not stop. <laughs> it might sound strange, but this is the motivation in me that I would continue to the very end. I mean, Paul said when he was ready to die, he said, I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. And that is the challenge, to finish what God has given us to do and to keep the faith to the end, to make sure that our hope is sure. And then in verse 12, he puts a slightly different context. We don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those through faith and patience inherit what has been promised, because at the end of it, what I want to remind you here is, as I did if you read my book on or listened to my messages on Ephesians, the fact is this, that our salvation down here is not complete. We live down here a life of hardship and struggle and fighting, 
Our reward is in heaven, not here. Don't look for your reward down here. Look for your reward in the kingdom. That is your inheritance, the kingdom of God. We inherit all the glory of God's kingdom. And in verse 13, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. Oh, that to Abraham, who was childless until his old age. Childless until old age. And yet, Abraham was faithful and believed, and he received that son, Isaac, in the end, and through Isaac became a great, powerful nation. So after waiting so patiently, Abraham received the reward. In verse 16, men swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what's said, and should put an end to argument. <laughs> um, I wish this were a little bit more true today, but it certainly is from a legal sense that if you have a legal argument, if you have a legal agreement, that does solve the issue. But he puts it like this. Because there is an oath which puts an end to argument, God wanted to make the absolute certainty and the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear. To who? To the heirs of that promise. And we live today knowing the certainty that God cannot fail. God will keep every promise in the book. And God confirmed it. And in verse 18, God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled from the world and taken hold of this new faith offered to us, may be encouraged. Because in verse 19, this hope that we have is the anchor that keeps our soul. You know, you know I'm a sailor, and I know what an anchor is, and I know how the ship is dependent on it, but we have an anchor that keeps the soul firm and secure. Why? Because the anchor is not in sand. The anchor is, Paul says, in the heavenly place, in the inner sanctuary, behind the curtain, where Jesus, who went before us, has entered. So. Our anchor, we're, our faith, our salvation is anchored in heaven because that's what it says. That's where Jesus, who's gone before us, has gone and entered into the very kingdom of heaven as we know. And just as we have the certainty that Jesus is in heaven, so we have the certainty that our hope, our faith, is anchored in heaven. So this is why Jesus is so, so many times referred to as the illustration, the evidence, and the proof. For example, with resurrection, how do we know the evidence of resurrection is Jesus rose from the dead. He was human. I was talking about this and preaching on Sunday morning, uh, that the that Jesus was so human, he divested himself of everything and lived as we live, subject to all the sin, the temptations that we have without sin. But the fact is this, that when he went to death, he did so in the greatest act of faith. A 33-year-old young evangelist went to that cross, not well, his only certainty was in his father that he would rise again. 
but the fact is he did and was seen alive for 40 days. So you see the evidence that our anchor is in Christ, where Jesus, who went before us, is there, and he has become our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And that is another big subject which I'm going to have to deal with next week. God bless you. Keep watching. Keep listening. My God will supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful promise. When you are committed to and support the gospel, then stand on this promise that when you give to the extension of the kingdom, God will supply all your need. Jesus called it giving and receiving. This year God has given us wonderful opportunities to preach the gospel in Armenia, Georgia and Poland. And we continue to support Ukraine by distributing humanitarian and spiritual aid. For 12 months, our staff have helped the displaced, vulnerable and injured, supplying food and medicines. To make a donation, visit eurovision.org.uk forward slash donation. We would like to give you a free gift. David Hathaway's Prophetic Vision magazine is available free of charge. All you need to do is ask for it. This faith-building resource will show you the path to revival in your life and ministry. To receive this free magazine, visit eurovision.org.uk forward slash magazine. God has a plan and a purpose for you to fulfill. Through faith, you will see miracles, heal the sick, and your prayers will be answered. In David Hathaway's two new books, A Faith Beyond and Power Your Inheritance, you will discover that with God, all things are possible. Order these books today. Visit eurovision.org.uk forward slash shop.